What you just heard was Une Histoire Simple, a composition by Babic Reinhardt and um, David Reinhardt, Babic's son, Django's grandson, recorded this uh, for DC Music School. The lesson series are available on DC Music School, so check them out. Hi, everybody. Um, here I am in Osaka, in the Kansai region of Japan. Uh, I love it here. And today's video is a little bit of a special video. It's totally unscripted, so I don't know where I'm going to go with this. But many of you have been asking me about like running a music business or trying to understand how my business works. And in the past videos, I've been kind of saying that it's been very, very difficult post-pandemic. So in this video, I'm going to explain all this. This is kind of a strange video or difficult video to me because I don't want my YouTube channel to be some kind of like vlog. Hey guys, I'm here in Osaka. Um, I want my YouTube channel to to help people. I don't know why I like to help people. Well, I like to see people succeed. I like to see good people succeed because I have this core belief that the world will be better if people are in general are doing well, especially really good people. Well, let's put it this way. Imagine you yourself are doing extremely, extremely well, but everyone around you is miserable. That can only last so long before there's a revolution, before there's unrest. And so in general, in life, I really do believe it's better for people to be relatively prosperous, be able to enjoy life, so to speak. So that's what I want my YouTube channel to be. And it really touches my heart when some people privately message me telling me that, you know, for some reason, something that I said inspired them to do better. Because the only, that's the only thing we can do uh, is to try. And I don't consider myself a particularly gifted person in any sense of the word but if I do have something is that once I'm, I've set my mind to do something I'm going to do it and this has a lot to do with my father passing away very very suddenly he was not supposed to pass away he passed away um, just after I finished high school and he was about to celebrate I think something like his 30th wedding anniversary with my mother he was about to sell, he was about to retire and just spend the rest of his life with my mom and you have to understand that my father kind of he didn't abandon the family but he left the family to kind of pursue his dreams and he supported us the whole family from far away since i was i don't know maybe eight years old or something so for a good 12 years i didn't really get to see my father very very often and that was especially difficult for my mother for them to be apart. We'd see each other, you know, like in the during school summer vacation when we go join him in Japan or Taiwan, wherever he was, or he'd come back. So he passed away before uh, retirement. And, you know, it's kind of like a. It's kind of like a sick joke. From the sky above you know he had a dream for his country for Taiwan and he he felt it was important to to pursue that dream to 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 develop Taiwan and so he went back there even though they tried to assassinate him but uh, yes that was my father and so he made a promise, I guess, to my mom that, okay, you would do this thing, this mission of his. And when it's all over, they could spend the rest of their life together. And just one month before that happened, boop, all gone. And that completely shocked me. And it changed me as a person, hopefully for the better. And that's why... I realized when there's something you feel passionate about and you want to do it, now's the time. Don't talk about it. Do it. And uh, yes, so those are the kind of 
things I want to talk about in this video. By the way, it would mean so much if you could like and subscribe, or if you want to even support me, you can buy something on DC Music School, Sound Slice. I want to talk to you about why I need money. Well, of course I need to live, but why I need to get rich. Don't mind the title, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but you're gonna understand everything now, my whole reason for doing this. And also today is a very special day because it's the day that Django passed away 70 years ago. And I think about this all the time, at least a few times a month, if not every day, how thankful I am to have a career, to be able to, to say that I can make a living solely from music. It's the only thing I've ever done in my life, music. Never had any other kind of job. Um, if it weren't for Django Reinhardt, I don't know what I would be doing right now. I don't know if I could be working as a musician or something. And this whole DC music school thing that I do, um, that I started in 2011, if I'm not mistaken, I registered this business around this time, around the month of May or so in 2011. So that was 12 years ago. And it's actually something that was I was toying around with in my head for maybe at least a year, if not more. How it all started was, um, I think maybe in 2006, there was this company in Canada, Hyper Hip Media, that made instructional DVDs. And I talked, as in, I, I'm from Montreal, and this person is from Toronto, so it's very close. So I got talking to the, to the owner of that business about making some kind of like instructional video for, for Gypsy Jazz rhythm in particular because at that time there was no there was no information no accurate information um if i dare say by that time i had befriended many great musicians in the gypsy jazz community the sinti community the gypsy community itself from whom i learned how to play this music i thought okay maybe it would be cool for the especially for the north american market to to do a course on gypsy jazz rhythm so I thought, okay, this could be fun, you know, like, to be honest, I didn't do it for the money. I did it, again, because I thought it would be great if others could learn what I, I, what, I, what I was able to learn. I was very lucky to be able to learn. So we did that DVD. Uh, I think they printed 1,000, that company printed 1,000 DVDs. Within a year, the entire stock was liquidated. And I actually made quite... A bit of money from that not as much as I could have because I didn't know anything about business and quite frankly I don't blame the the owner because he himself didn't know much about this business it was the first time that he had seen success and I basically signed a contract where I where I didn't really get to see maybe the percentage that I feel that I should have gotten but that's that's that nonetheless we sold 1,000 DVDs in less than a year so I did make some money and I've heard and what was very very shocking for me was that it was not just North Americans buying people in Europe were buying it too people in Europe already have access to great players they could just actually go and ask if they can maybe take lessons or something but yet they, they bought my so really those who did buy that stuff thank you um, well with that money that I made I, I, I decided, hey, why don't we make a few more DVDs, you know, like show more things, which I did. And that again, made, sold a lot, a lot. And again, me not knowing the business very well, I didn't get the percentage that I felt I should have gotten. Then, of course, I got to work with Stokolo Rosenberg and all these people. And one thing I realized then, is how important your reputation is. I found out that Stoklo Rosenberg accepted to work with me because he had consulted with Tim Cliphouse about working with me. The violinist Tim Cliphouse who used to play with the Rosenberg Trio. And thank you, Tim. If this is the true story, I'm not sure, but apparently Tim said something like, oh, don't worry about Dennis Chang. You don't even need to sign a contract. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it, which is very true. Because here's the thing. I didn't know anything about business. I wouldn't dare say that I know a lot nowadays. I know more than I used to. But I gave Tim a deal that was very, very good. 
but that was not so good for me. And everything was signed. And I did mention that, like, oh, wow, I kind of screwed up the contract. But you know what? This is what I said I'd do. This is what we're going to do, and that's fine. And that, in turn, actually paid off because now it showed that I'm a person of integrity. So I did that thing with Stoklo. It sold well. But I was starting to realize I wasn't being compensated the way I should have been. When I started talking with other people who were more experienced, who were in, in, in music business, I realized I was getting the sh short end of the, 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 the deal. And so my friend, uh, very good friend, Roberto Rosamond in Toronto, encouraged me to make my own business. Like cut out the middleman, be the boss. And I didn't want to do it. Why? Because I didn't even know how to start. I didn't know anything about recording. I didn't know anything about approaching artists. Uh, don't know how to record, don't have the equipment. It was just like so overwhelming. How to start a website, how to create a website. So, so very, very scary. And I must have hesitated for a year. And then eventually, uh, <laughs> actually what happened was it was around the time the, the, the world economy collapsed. And for a very, very brief period of time, the Canadian dollar was very strong. And that's where I bought all my recording gear, all like the expensive gear that I got for a massive discount due to the fact that the Canadian dollar was super strong and the prices hadn't changed to match the, the, the how do you say, the, the exchange rate. So I acquired all this gear. Then now what? How do I even record? How do I didn't even know how to like use Logic or Final Cut, how to edit videos. I looked online for some people who could help me. I paid them to like show me how to get started. And everything from there on was real, really just trial and error. And doing DC Music School in the beginning for me, uh, well, I did this for selfish reasons, actually. I did it more for myself than for anyone else. When I was growing up, I remember my brother, for some reason, he bought me some instructional videos from REH, Hot Licks, and I realized how very bad those videos were. Like the, the teachers didn't, the, the, the artists didn't know how to teach, or they were just showing things that weren't very interesting. But I do remember being so mesmerized by the playing like the instructional portion, I would skip it and I would just watch the, the, the intro segment where the players would play. And there was one video in particular by uh, Clint Strong, C-L-I-N-T Strong, uh, a Western swing jazz guitar player, country player. And there was a lot of performance in that video. And I was thinking, man, I can learn so much more from the performance than from the lesson portion. And what was very frustrating is, keep in mind that these are instructional videos, but whoever was directing these videos must have been some idiot or something because every time the guitar player would play something really cool, the camera would just pan away, go somewhere else. And that boggled my mind. Man, this is an instructional video. We want to learn. Just focus on the guitar. We don't care about the guy's smile. And so <laughs> that's what I decided to do with DC Musical. I would have artists play all these songs because... When I was learning to play jazz as a self-taught musician, I always wondered, oh, what would so-and-so play if, if they played uh, Autumn Leaves, if they played All of Me? You know, because sometimes when you're, let's say you're working on All of Me and your favorite artist hasn't recorded it, and therefore you can't figure out what they did. So that was my idea. Hey, get the artist to play these songs. So that's how I conceived DC Music School. I would record these artists playing all these typical songs and then I could go and check out what they did and learn from that. So again, DC Musical in the beginning was a little bit of a side thing. At that time, I was still a touring musician, uh, touring all over Canada, um, doing some gigs in the USA, doing some gigs in Europe, doing some workshops, that kind of stuff. I was teaching 
and I was doing this was like different sources, different streams of income. By 2000, maybe 15 or 16, after five years, like I, uh, in the beginning, again, like I said, it was a side thing. So I didn't really nurture DC Music School as I should have. So it was a little bit slow in the beginning, but it was always steadily making money. But then by around 2015, 2016, I was getting more and more artists and I was realizing it was starting to take a lot of my time. So I had to stop performing. Um, and I realized that if I continued doing this, I could actually make decent money without having to perform. One of the reasons why I stopped performing was because there was so much administration involved. I just really want, I'd rather be playing music or be or staying home recording artists than doing with dealing with administration or even politics like sorry for bringing politics to this but you know being told by people like how to act what to say what not to say and who to vote for even like my my management at the time told me not to vote for this person because they're of this political affiliation even though my political alignment was closer to that of my managers i would never ever dare tell anyone to vote for this or that you need to vote according to your convictions and if, if we disagree so be it that's that's democracy you know but that really annoyed me you know this kind of thing so that disgusted me and i didn't want to take part of that i just i still like performing as long as we get rid of all this political baggage Anyway, by like, let's say 2018, 2019, right before the pandemic, I had, I had everything all figured out. Um, I think around 2016, I, I was starting to burn out actually, because I was doing everything on my own, working easily eight to 12 hours a day. I think it was in 2016. Yeah, 2016, I worked every single day, not one single day of vacation, not one. 365 christmas day christmas eve new year's eve i worked 8 12 hours a day and naturally that destroyed my personal life uh it is what it is and that's when i started uh looking for help and now dc music school is a very very small team but i'm happy to to have the help that i have and here's the thing i never as I said, I never intended DC Music School to be something from which I could l live on and nor did I expect to have people work for me, but that is the reality that I, I'm in now. And there's a big problem with DC Music School is that it's, it's a quote-unquote boutique business. It's not mainstream at all because I was told by many people in the industry, more experienced people at the time, that if I really wanted to make money, the beginner market was where it's at. And just the other day, actually, and those of you who know me, I know that I'm studying Japanese, and I was looking at some forum or something where people were complaining that in, in the Japanese education market, everything is geared towards beginners. There, there are not many resources for advanced learners. And here I am making materials for advanced learners. It's such a niche market. To give you an example, the biggest company, one of the biggest companies in the world, I know for a fact from Insider Secrets, that they make seven figures in sales every month. That would be gross. Net, I don't know because they're, they're a big team. Of course, they have to pay their artists. There's a lot of overhead costs. But seven figures, seven digits every single month. I'm not even 1% there. Can you imagine that? If I could even reach 2% of what they make, I would be in a very, very, very good place. I would have a lot more resources to do what I do because this business is not a, just a matter of, hey, you want to do these videos? I record you and then boom, money grows on trees. No, there's a lot of things involved. And um, actually someone just messaged me a month or two ago <laughs> they didn't say it like that, but they said, Dennis, I want to do the same business with you. I want to compete against you. Tell me how to compete against you. <laughs> That's not how they said it. But you know what? I, I welcome, 
I welcome this. I'm not going to prevent anyone from, from doing business, the same kind of business as me. But ultimately, I feel that if I want my business to succeed, I am responsible for it. As long as everyone is acting ethically, there's room for everyone. But I told them, uh, basically in the beginning, don't worry so much about some of the things that I am worrying about at my stage. In the beginning, just do it however you can, you know, DIY, do it alone. Don't worry about certain aspects of it. And when you reach the level where you start have to worrying about it, that's when you start to worry about it. And that's exactly how it was for me. My business, I wouldn't say it's a huge business, but it has grown significantly to the point. Let me give you an analogy. I have another friend who created some kind of business, a technology and this technology is kind of gray area and he went to see a copyright lawyer the lawyer said this is a great piece of technology that you have don't worry about the legal aspects just do your thing but the day you start to make a lot of money we're going to sue you we're going to come after you this is the world that we live in folks and this is something that i understand perfectly in the beginning yeah, I just did my thing. No one really cared. When things started to grow, I noticed I started to have to protect myself. I had to hire certain people who specialize in certain things, special accountants um, to deal with certain things, tax issues, because people were starting to notice, hey, this person is starting to make money. How much can we get out of them? Actually, here, here's another analogy. When we first made that DVD, we didn't want to use any copyrighted material. So, um, and here's the thing about music law. It's very, it's very out of date because music copyright law is, is super outdated. And it's in, in my opinion, anyway, it's in tremendous need of a massive overhaul because, um, you know, things like YouTube streaming, everything, the laws that currently exist are laws from the ancient past and they badly need to be updated. They're being updated as we speak right now because every now, every, the past few years I've been getting these emails from these different companies, YouTube and everything, where I have to sign these tax things and everything. It's super complicated in that way. But I remember when I first made my DVD, I wasn't going to teach minor swing, but I was just going to say something like, I want to show you the chords that might be used over the song minor swing that would be perfectly legal but just in case we consulted um, uh, we contacted the the company that was in charge of uh, licensing for minor swing and basically the question was if i mention the name of a song should i have to pay for licensing you know what they said they said i don't remember exactly what they said but they said something like you know just to be safe you should pay us yeah yeah you should you should pay us we didn't pay them because I realized, no, that, that's, that's BS, man. You're allowed to say minor swing, man. So basically, you're, you're asking some greedy person, hey, if I can pay you money, would you accept it? Yes, yes, give me the money. This is the world that we live in. My business has grown to the point where there are people are looking at me and I have to be very, very careful. And to protect myself, I have to give money to certain people. It's like this whole ma mafia protection scheme. To, to make sure everything is in order. Uh, so it's just one big tremendous nightmare once your business grows. And I wanna go on record that as far as I know, I'm 100% clean in the, the tax department. Like I declare everything the way I'm supposed to be. And now, but because my business is growing, there are certain things I cannot do anymore. I'm not gonna say it, but there's some artists, I guess. What artists wanna do with the money that I give them that's their own business. On my end, I'm clean as far as the government is concerned. But I've had to change my practices now. Like whatever they want to do, they can do, the artists. But I need to be 100% transparent. So I have to do things in a very transparent way. No more cash deals anymore. Everything has to be signed, contracts and everything like that. So I can show the government should they choose to investigate me, which they did for about over a year until they realized I was 100% legit. But you know how stressful that is to be investigated for an entire year? Look at the band Metallica. They started 
as a bunch of punk kids playing garage rock metal but now they're an entire corporation with a legal team and all sorts of things like accountants special accountants special lawyers to deal with this special managers and everything it's that's that's the the nature of of the entertainment industry so here's the thing by about maybe 2017 2018 2019 i was starting to see growth in my business and also i was starting to feel a little bit stressed no well, not stressed but because i have people working for me i need to make sure that they can make some money from my business and we were in a very good position because at that time by that time i knew how to run this business i was so used to doing this and there was a routine and it was very 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 effective then the pandemic happened and that's when everything just collapsed for two years dc music school couldn't produce anything in 2020 um we actually sold a lot of lessons made i was very very lucky to myself not be financially impacted by the the pandemic in the sense that I had savings and that DC Music School was still selling stuff online. The passive income saved me. But not being able to produce more material uh, affected my business as well. Because eventually when you stop updating things, you become irrelevant. And in this business, it's always about being re relevant. And that's when I started doing this YouTube thing. You'll notice, like uh, actually started just a little bit before the pandemic. And I'm glad I'm doing this now because in this in this business you can't expect to make it big one time and then live off of that forever unless you made like tons and tons of money. But no, you have to stay relevant. You have to keep uh, doing things so that people know that you exist. That's why until this day, a company like Coca-Cola is still spending a lot of money on publicity, commercials and all that. And this is the reason why I have this YouTube channel is to stay relevant because I'm not no longer performing. I'm no longer teaching. I'm putting all my energy into to this, into developing this passive income thing. And thank you to all of you who contribute in whatever way you can, even if it's just liking or subscribing or leaving a comment it makes such a huge difference. I really, really appreciate it. So in 2020, it was such a frustrating well, the first the first few months were good. I was I felt so thankful that I wasn't financially impacted immediately. And there was also a deep sense of frustration in seeing a lot of people that I care about suffer. And because I was doing very well, I helped some of these friends. I asked for nothing in return. I in retrospect, I should not have done this. But all, at the same time, I don't regret it. But I must have spent over $10,000, donated over $10,000. Didn't ask for anything in return just to, to help people who were desperate. Because they weren't allowed to work. And I felt so bad that here I am, making, still making a lot of money. And these people are suffering. And I said, all right, listen, man, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to pay your rent. I'm going to pay this. Don't pay me back. Over $10,000. In retrospect, I should not have done this. Because after that... By 2021, I noticed that sales, because I wasn't updating DC Music School, sales started to decline. And that's also when the government started to want to invest in me. They tried to squeeze as much money as they could out of me. Um, and so I found myself in a position where I was still making money, but I had to be very, very, very careful with the money as well. So maybe I shouldn't have given, donated over $10,000, whatever. I was very, very frustrated by these people in power who said it's for our own good not to work. Now, in the beginning, of course, we have to be very careful. We have to be, uh, we can't be selfish, definitely. And there definitely was a health concern. But the thing is, it's so easy for someone who's financially secure to tell some to tell other people don't worry about money worry about your health you know it's kind of like a rich person saying i don't care about money money's not important come on when there are people in this world who are starving who are desperate for money 
It's such a pathetic thing to say when you're filthy rich and you say something like that. And here we had people saying, stay home, stop working, don't be selfish. Everyone who said that, I noticed one thing. They were financially secure. Or their parents paid for their rent or they lived with their parents. You know, how selfish can you be? They're not wrong in saying that we have to worry about our health. It's such an easy thing to say when you're in that position. And I thought a lot about people who were not in that position. And that's one of the reasons why I help people out, pay their rent, pay this, pay that, pay their health bill, their medical bills. In 2022, the powers that be decided you are allowed to resume your activities. And then I realized, oh my goodness, inflation has destroyed my business. In the past, my business was doing so well that I could like spend money like this, like that, to, to pursue projects that no one might care for. You know, some people tell, oh, Dennis, you should produce, you should do in the style that you should produce. I would be your first customer. Okay, you know how much it costs to make each of my lessons? It costs several thousand dollars. If you can provide several thousand dollars, guarantee me several thousand dollars in sales, then sure. But if you're the only one who buys it, I'm screwed. But before the pandemic, I could do stuff like that. I had enough money because I, I had a system, like a whole routine. I had a hotel where I could book for the artist, flights, cheap flights, but cheap but comfortable flights. Everything was super affordable. Now what I noticed post-pandemic, a lot of the hotels that I used to use no longer exist. And the hotels that now exist are at the, at the very least 30%, if not 100% more expensive. Flights are 30 to 50, 60% more expensive. Like everything has increased drastically. And so my previous model no longer works. Um, so I realized what I would do is I would do one trip. I would travel to the musicians, to a country. So that's what I did in, in January of 2022. I traveled to Europe for two months. And on that one trip, I recorded tons and tons of musicians so as to lower the average cost for each product so that the artist can potentially earn more money. Production costs, editing costs, uh, transcriptions, flights, hotels, everything, you know, that all factors into everything. And I also always advance the artists something quite generous so that no matter what, even for the product that we created together flops, they were compensated for their time. So uh, I invest tons and tons of money up front to to create these products and that's why in 2022 and 2023 we released a lot of lessons and now we're kind of in this situation where we're, admittedly we are a bit overwhelmed with trying to finish these transcriptions some of these people i think maybe you lock yourselves in your rooms with a uh, lotion and you watch these videos eagerly waiting for transcriptions so you can you know spank the monkey so to speak and then you get these emails from people so angry because they paid 20 18 dollars euro uh us or 18 euros to access something where you get like tons and tons of transcriptions and they're not ready yet so they they send me hate mail uh it's not easy to get these kinds of emails like these trolls who get so angry granted these people are an extreme minority but it just takes one asshole to ruin things the mood that's why I have I hire someone to take care of the emails too, so that I don't have to deal with that aspect. Truth is, most of you are super cool. And then people, of course, they mean well, say, hey, Dennis, maybe you should do this. Uh, if I were you, I would do this. You don't run my business. You don't know what my business is like. You don't think I've thought of that? I've considered many, many options, and I still am. I'm still figuring things out. There are a lot of interesting options. It reminds me of this thing, you know, bless my mother. But when she found out I was working with Jason Becker, uh, who is a rock star who has been living with ALS for over 20 years, she actually told me to forward Jason this article that she Googled about how to live with ALS, like treatments for ALS. I told my mother, you, before I worked with, J with Jason Becker, 
you didn't even know what ALS was. And now you googled an article about how to cure ALS. You don't think that Jason Becker hasn't explored all the possible resources in the 20 years plus that he's been living with ALS? So that's the same thing for me. Like I get these emails by people who mean well, but who have absolutely no idea how I run my business, how anything works, like the legal aspects, the, the account and the financial aspects. Oh, man, Dennis, if I were you, uh, I, I, I would do uh, this, uh, you know? Sorry, sorry if you're offended, but like, man, I put a lot of thought into this. And I actually consult a lot of people who are in the industry, actually know what I go through and I'm still considering the options. So the pandemic, the, po the world in the post-pandemic changed things a lot and I cannot f make DC Music School work the way it used to work before. I have to find a new way. I'm considering different options, but last year, what all, all the things that I recorded last year, uh, that's probably the last batch I'm gonna do. From now on, I'm gonna have to find another way to do things. Of course, it's gonna continue, but I have to find a new model that makes sense because keep in mind also that I do have a small team and I'm trying to feed them as well. I want to guarantee them like a steady stream of income as well, not just for myself, it's for them as well. And even though my business did grow, uh, so did the overhead, the, all the expenses. Post pandemic, I was also, we use a lot of third party services to run my business and I got this email from uh, that they were increasing the prices by 200% to use the licensing and it's their right you know I understand we all have to do things but like well suddenly I need to make x percentage x percent more to to keep my business afloat and so it seems as though my business is doing well financially, but if you look at my tax records, I'm not making any much more money. If not, I'm not exactly sure. I haven't looked exactly, I haven't compared, but I think it's roughly the same, if not less, because I've had to hire all these extra specialists just to make sure everything is according to me. Because if I make one mistake, people are gonna come looking for me and I'm gonna have to pay the price. So when you're running a business, you start out as a nobody, no one cares about you. Then you reach a stage, someone's gonna start caring about you, so you have to protect yourself. You hire the right people, and on it goes like that. So then, it, I guess it's always in three steps. You start as a nobody, then the second step, you start to make some money, but then because you make some money, some people are gonna, some sharks are gonna come after you. So you use that extra money to protect yourself. So you end up not making any more money. Then the third step is that you make that extra money on top. So then finally, okay, then you make the money. Then the fourth step, and it goes on like that. And fourth, the fourth step, again, it grows again. You hire extra people. Fifth step, you make money. Sixth step, you have to hire people. So every, oh, it's only every two steps that you actually start to make money. I'm in the step where I've grown, but I had to hire all sorts of specialists to protect my, my interests. I also want to say something about my DC Music School business. I'm probably one of the only businesses out there who give artists complete freedom. Because there's still some business out there making artists sign exclusive contracts so they can't work with anyone else for a determined period of time. I don't have such a clause. We do a proje project together, you are free to do other projects. How generous is that? People say that I'm a good businessman, but the truth is I'm not a good businessman at all. Uh, the truth is, to do good mis business, you have to be a certain kind of human being. The kind of human being that I don't want to be. And there are some artists who aren't like that either, but they know how to surround themselves with snakes. And when you can work with snakes, that's one way you can stay who you are and make money. Uh, and the thing is, I have trouble working with... Uh, building long-term relationships with snakes. It's, you have to be kind of a narcissist. I'll give you an example. There's a musician who is now pretty famous, but before they were famous, we were playing in a country together, a very, very, very expensive country in a very, very expensive city. The gig didn't pay a lot, so we couldn't stay in a hotel. 
this person with a big house offered to house us. I was so very grateful. I told this person, our host, man, thank you so much. Um, let me treat you dinner. You don't have to pay anything. Like, let me invite you backstage, whatever. I'll pay for everything. And then the other person who is now famous said to the host, hey, I just released a new CD. You should buy it. And you know what? The host bought it. That's the kind of person you have to be to succeed in the business world. And I don't have that kind of business, that, that personality to, to be that way. So it's difficult. Um, I'm just sharing all this so that those of you who are curious now know some of the things that go behind the scenes. It's, there's a lot of things involved just to make this thing work. Some of you have even said to Dennis, why don't you just hire more transcribers? I have actually hired a few more transcribers, but the truth is, I have to be loyal. There are people who are working for me, who are counting on me for a steady stream of income. And if I hire too many, then I end, up, I end up screwing the people who have been faithful to me. I try to make sure that they can work every month. So I, because we released so many, so many lessons last year, I had to increase my number of transcribers, but I'm not looking for any more. I'm trying to make sure because I don't know when I'm going to pr produce the next batch of lessons and I want to guarantee them work every month. So you see, I am considering a lot of things despite what you may think. You can't know what you don't know. I don't live a life of luxury. I'm not interested in like material things. This is not a fancy guitar. Uh, where I'm staying here, this Airbnb is not fancy at all. It's, I'm in the ghetto. I'm in like the red light district <laughs> uh, among gangsters. I don't need much to be happy but for my personal life, but I need a lot of money, a lot of resource to be able to do the things that I do. And I really want to get rich so that I can do the things, so that I can hire more people and that I can run things more efficiently and do more and more and contribute to the, the music world. So all the money that I make it goes towards creating more and more projects. So that's why if you guys can support me, I really, really appreciate it. I don't know if DC Music School would ever reach one or even 2% of what the biggest company makes. But if that ever even happens, my God, I could do such, I could do miracles. One of the reasons why I also stopped performing is because I didn't want to deal with the politics uh, of performance. There's a lot of jealousy in the music world. Uh, you guys have no idea, like all the, the factions behind the scenes. And I try not to be part of this. And I, I want to go on record to say that there are some people who hate my ass. That's fine. But I want to go on record to say that I never prevented such people from getting job opportunities if I felt if they were a good fit. There are some people who absolutely despise me, but I've recommended to festivals and everything because I know that they're competent, that they're great musicians, and therefore, just because they hate me, they shouldn't be prevented from working. I want to go on record saying that because for some time, there were some people who avoided talking to me because they thought I badmouthed them, because I hung out with people who badmouthed them. We're not talking about that person when I'm with this person. Just because I hang out with X doesn't mean that I automatically disassociate myself from Y. That's not how I am. Yeah, one person told me like, oh, Dennis, I thought you, you became one of them. Like, what do, you, what do you mean? Like, I thought you hated me. That absolutely not true at all. There's so much politics, like the interpersonal relationships. I just want to avoid all that drama, which is why I start to do things on my own, this DC musical or I'm my own boss. But then I can't avoid it now. The politics follows me because now sometimes I go to places, some artists come to me, people, I swear, they come to me and they kind of say like, they're angry at me. Like, who do you think you are, Dennis? I'm nobody. Why won't you hire me? Am I not good enough for you? Whoa. Come on, man. Now you have to understand, some people have this idea that I have the power to make someone famous, that I'm an influencer or something. I don't consider myself an influencer. Uh, 
if I inspire someone or whatever, if I can give someone inspiration, great. But I don't consider myself an active influencer. I'm not trying to be that person high up on a pedestal telling me, you are worthy of my time. Come to my inner circle. No, I'm not that kind of person at all. And some people think that I can make them famous and rich. That is not the case. If I could do that, you know who I'd make rich and famous? Me, myself. That's why every week I'm making these YouTube videos because it helps to... Every time I make this video, my channel grows a little bit. I make a little bit of money from the YouTube advertisement and, and a small, small, tiny percentage of viewers who watch my YouTube videos actually go and buy something on Bandcamp or DC Music or Sound Slice. Really, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. But that's the gist of it. That's the gist of DC Music School. If you have any questions like you want me to address, feel free to ask. I'll see if maybe I can talk about it. I can also talk about why I moved to Japan. It's a, that's a fun story too. It's pandemic related as well. I gave up a very good career to move to Japan. If I stayed in Europe or in America, I could still be performing with a lot of great players. But instead, I came to Japan. Uh, so that's a, that's a different story. So that's the story of how I created DC Musical, how I run it, why it's run the way it's run, and why right now I'm still figuring things out. I don't know if this video was interesting, but there we go. Thanks for watching. I think there's one more thing I should say. Is that this pandemic thing was not obviously not supposed to happen. It affected all of us. And that thing I said about, you know, you reach this stage and then after you have to protect it by hiring all these things. This is happening to me right now. But on top of that, there's also the fact that the pandemic overnight caused everything to become expensive by X percent. I don't know, 30, 40, 50 percent. It's, it's really, really, really tough. But what I want to say is that despite all this, the, bad, the pandemic was obviously not a good thing. But in life, you know, it's great to, to actually complain about it. It's therapeutic. Of course, here I am. It feel, actually feels good to say all this stuff. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you, were, you live in the world of reality. And you can't just like wish for things to come back to the way they were. Um, it's not going to happen. At least I don't think so. And therefore, you need to figure something out. You need to adapt. And that's what I've been doing. One of the reasons why I moved to Japan, all these things, you have to find a way as soon as possible to adapt. Barring extreme situations, and this actually is an extreme situation, but you are in charge of your own destiny. If, you know, like, okay, the pandemic just royally messed up my plans. It just changed everything. But at the end of the day, if I just stay here and complain, that's all I do, then my business will tank. I have to fight. You have to be responsible for your own future. And I, I, I say this as a warning because I know from a long time ago, there were some musicians that I really admired who had like a big hit at some point in their life when the, the music industry was a certain way before like the whole internet thing. Like they had like... Uh, like this one th moment through a record label and they're just it's funny they were just so proud of that and they were complaining oh the new model is wrong it shouldn't be this way this person nearly ended up being homeless because they refused to adapt to the new world this is like 15 years ago you know when the whole youtube thing was happening facebook everything they completely refused to adopt like the new technology and as a result they faded into obscurity and now they had to move back to their parents' home. Like, imagine being like 50 years old, having to move back to your parents' home. And like, only now, like 20 years later, starting to like, all right, maybe I should check out uh, this, uh, this Facebook thing. But by now, Facebook is irrelevant. It's all about all these other things. <laughs> it's crazy. It sucks, you know, but this is the world that we live in. I have to adapt. And I'm saying this, those of you who want to make a living playing music, you, you have to, you can't just be expecting things to come to you. 
Sometimes you'll be lucky, sometimes you won't, but most of the time you have to make, you have to take charge of your own destiny. Man, if I had a lot of money, I would be creating jobs. Because what I would be doing, I would be able to make more YouTube videos. I would have people edit them for me. I just have to do the filming. I'd be so much more uh, productive. It really sucks, you know, to be at my age when I, before the pandemic, everything was on a straight path. I knew how the future would be like. I could calculate, make rough, accurate calculations of my uh, the, about the the growth of my career. But now everything's like just boom, disappeared, and I'm like the rest of of you just trying to figure things out, uh, figure out the new world. But that's how it is. And so shall it be. I really hope that maybe this could help some of you, inspire some of you to just go for it. Um, if you guys like this kind of, these kinds of topics like business, music business, I can make more videos about that. We'll see. It all depends on the number of views and comments. Bye.